I am very excited to be here with you today. It's, uh, it's my honor to, uh, to be able to share uh, a few things. Um, and I just want to quick uh, bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we can spend together. I ask that you remain with us in this place. And may you speak through me. And may I be a reflection of you. In your name we pray. Amen. My name is Adam Weeks. For those of you who may be new, I'm the youth pastor here. It is my, my honor to, to do that. We're talking about choosing your own adventure. You um, may or may not know, uh, gentlemen, um, there's a story back in the um, late 70s, early 80s, gentleman by the name of Julius Goodman. Um, let's see if we can get this going. Other way. It's always the other way. It's always the other way. Do you know by the name of Julius Goodman? He was a lawyer, and um, he had this tradition with his family. You may have this tradition with your family, is that every evening at bedtime, he would tell stories to his children. He felt that he had missed his calling of uh, law school, and he should have been a, a storyteller. And, and so he would tell these stories to his kids, and he had these characters that he would develop. And one evening, you know, many you know, years of doing this, he kind of got stuck and trying to think of what happened. And he turned to his kids and, well, what do you think happened next? And they jumped right in and they told him, like, oh, well, this happens and um, they should do this. And that was great. And so he continued the story and they kind of picked how the story went. And again, it happened the next evening. Oh, they should do this. And the kids had kind of known the characters so well that they got to choose their own adventure. Not long after that, he decided to write these stories down, um, try to get them published, didn't take off at, uh, you know, limited success. But what really happened, what really propelled him to success was they donated 100,000 of these books to libraries across the country, and then almost overnight, immediate success, millions were sold, TV shows, um, Choose Your Own Adventure was something that captured the hearts and imaginations of youth all over the country, all over the world. I think of life as a choose your own adventure. Um, I've also thought that the Bible was a perfect, uh, could have been a perfect place for choosing your, your own adventure. Um, there's some stories in the Bible that I think uh, would lend themselves to a choose your own adventure story. You could think of uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Turn to page 45 to close your window while you are praying, or turn to page 17 to be thrown into the lion's den. It could have gone that way. Perhaps Noah's Ark. It's getting stormy, and a lion waits to its turn to enter the ark. Turn to page 38 to let the ferocious beast into the ark, or turn to page 46 to... Run and hide. Moses, that would have been another good one. Children of Israel, turn to page 89 to let all of those ungrateful people fend for, themse fend for themselves as Pharaoh's army approaches. Or turn to page 16 to try and part the Red Sea. What will he do? David and Goliath. Turn to page 19 and hurl a small stone at a warrior giant. Or turn to page 16 and mind your own business and go back home and take care of the sheep. What will he do? Of course, Jesus is, stories, is one of the best examples that I can think of. The best example that I think of life of Jesus comes from John 8. Here, let's read this passage together. John 8, 2 through 6. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This 
they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Turn to page 74 to do, to do what, Jesus? Jesus, what are you going to do? This is a no-win scenario. If you say to follow the law, then you're committing a woman to being stoned? And if you say, well, no, disregard the law, then you said to disregard the law, throw out the law? There is no possible solution to this. It's a no-win situation. As I was thinking of other examples of no-win scenarios, I can guarantee you that my mind went to some place that yours didn't. Star Trek. <laughs> See, told you. You didn't think that I was going to go to Star Trek. In the early 80s, a Star Trek movie came out with a subplot about the Kobayashi Maru, our Captain Kirk um, was put to the test. The Kobayashi Maru was a test as well as the name of a ship. This test was part of the war games that they would use in a, as a simulation to test whether or not these young cadets could lead their own ship. The Kobayashi Maru in the ecosystem of Star Trek um, was well known as a no-win scenario. The situation kind of basically is this. Your ship comes across a distress signal. The problem is that the distress signal is on the other side of enemy lines. The distress signal is that there's a fire on board and many hundreds of people are going to die if you do not save them. But if you cross the line, you could enter into a war. So the Captain Kirk decides to cross the line. And of course, immediately the other, the enemy comes and is ready to attack. The ship is outnumbered. This is a no-win scenario. In the lore of Star Trek, it was designed to teach these young cadets that sometimes there is a no-win scenario and how to keep your cool under that situation. What do you do in a no-win scenario? Sometimes you might have to sacrifice others for the greater good or for your own good. Well, in Captain Kirk, he wasn't going to let that happen because he said, I don't believe in no-win scenarios. And so he changed the rules of engage engagement he changed how the program worked, and he was able to save both the crew. They brought them on board, and in heroic fashion, also um, attacked the other enemies, and they were able to go flee to safety because Captain Kirk does not believe in a no-win scenario. We try to use past experiences when it comes to no-win scenarios. Thinking of no-win scenarios, another example came to mind. Yours probably won't have come here either. Uh, the Oregon Trail. Last summer, uh, my lovely wife uh, read to us at evening time uh, these Oregon Trail books. Also sort of a choose-your-own trail um, situation. Um, these were fun books to read. And I would be sitting there listening to the story, and there was foreshadowing happening and they would talk about the importance of not crossing a river because you don't know how deep it is or if your oxen will get stuck. And so, sure enough, a couple pages later, towards the end of the chapter, you're presented with the option, do you cross the river? Turn to page 72. Do you stay there and wait till the water recedes? Turn to page 84. And what was interesting about this is that I, in my Wisdom, I had been paying attention to the foreshadowing, said, oh no, you don't cross the river because then your oxen will get stuck and you know, everyone will drown. But what was interesting about this book is that time after time, even when you had been forewarned, an experience from the past, so you say, all right, let's wait and see. Let's turn to page and let's, let's wait and see. Well, then the, the dysentery got you or, or whatever it was. Even 
our experiences from the past aren't always good guideposts to know what to do when we are confronted with a no-win scenario. So you might ask, Pastor Adam, how does this apply to me? I'm not a hero of the Bible. I'm not going on the Oregon Trail, and I'm definitely not Captain Kirk. How does this apply to me? Well, let's do a little choose our own adventure here today. We can make uh, this sermon be a (laughs) choose your own sermon. Is that how this works? I'm going to ask for some participation. Uh, Let's set the scene. You have been invited over for a dinner. Your family is at another friend's house and you're having dinner. There's five or six of you all sitting around the table having a lovely conversation when a controversial subject comes up. So I'll need some suggestions. Uh, This could be anything from uh, Ford uh, versus Chevy versus Dodge. This could be uh, electric cars versus gas cars. This could be, uh, dare we say, um, Republicans versus Democrats. We could get really exciting here. What's, uh, what, what should we do? Uh, go ahead and say something. Um, what, what's our controversial subject? What was it? Trump versus Biden. Okay, that's a good one. All right. This will be interesting. We're choosing our own adventure today. You're all sitting around the table and your host says something about um, Biden. And he says, wow, I can't believe that Biden did. What should Biden do? Choose your own adventure. What should Biden do? Biden saved an animal. Wow, Biden saved an animal. That's a great thing. Biden, so everyone said the story. Yeah, did, did you hear the news story about how President Biden saved an animal the other day? And for someone else who isn't very excited about President Biden um, and this new controversial thing, you have an option. Someone who doesn't think that this was a good thing, Maybe the animal shouldn't have been saved. Whatever it was, you've got three choices. One, you can give a mini TED Talk, facts and figures, names, all kinds of information about why President Biden should not be defended. You have another option of saying, oh, and not engaging. And then you have another option of, that's very interesting, Tell me more. What should we do? Should we do, give him any TED talk? Should we let it just say, oh, and not engage because we disagree with that? Or should we ask to learn more? What should we do? A, B, or C? It's hard to know. B, let us say, oh. Here's the thing that happens when we choose our, when we have an opportunity to choose our own adventure. You are going to constantly be coming in contact with scenarios that you disagree with. And those have an opportunity to be tied emotionally to something you believe very strongly. And when someone comes to you, you may feel something that may be a little bit more perhaps uh, controversial than Biden choosing to uh, save an animal. And that has come up, hasn't it? Someone has said something to you that you had an emotional, strong reaction. No, they're wrong. That probably has happened. If it hasn't, it will. You have an option of giving a mini TED talk. Let me tell you why you're wrong. You're wrong because of this, 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 and this. Here are all the facts. Here are the statistics. Here's the reason why you're wrong. When it comes to an emotional, an emotionally held belief, is that going to change their mind? Are they suddenly going to believe differently than how they believed before? Or will you more likely 
enter into an argument where by the end of that argument, you may have one less friend. And the dinner party is ruined. You also are not required to have an opinion. There is no law that says you have to defend your point of view. You can say, oh, interesting that you would think that. You are not required. There is another option. You can try and learn more about where that person is coming from. Right now, we have some really big, difficult things that are decisions, things that are, that are affecting our, company, our, our country. Roe v. Wade is, is, a, is a huge thing that's happening right now and tearing people apart on different sides of this very contentious issue. We have to be careful not to lose our friends and family over things like that. Social media is doing a really good job of make, putting people into different camps. The devil is actively working through the echo chamber that is social media and the not-so-social media to constantly reaffirm our biases to tell us how different we are from one another. Instead of trying to find common ground, we are constantly bombarded with our own tribalism that says, hey, I'm going to reaffirm the position that you have. I'm going to reaffirm, I'm going to say that they're different from you and that we can't find common ground. The devil is really good at doing that. There's an interesting study that I want to see if we can pull up here that helps illustrate this point. Let's see if it flies them away. In one study, scientists asked people if they believed in man-made climate change and then categorized them as either believers or deniers. They then told some that scientists had reevaluated the data and concluded that predictions for the future were much worse than before, while some others were told the situation wasn't nearly as bad as once thought. But these facts had an interesting result on their beliefs. People who didn't believe in climate change and were told that things were going to be much worse completely ignored this fact and their opinions were unchanged. But if they were told that things weren't nearly as bad, their beliefs moved much farther in that direction. And the same thing happened to those who believed strongly in climate change. When told that things are now predicted to be worse, they shifted their opinions more strongly in that direction, whereas those told it wouldn't be so bad didn't change their opinions at all. The facts only caused people to polarize. It turns out that... So... ...analyze them away. Oh. In one study... Here we go. So if you didn't quite catch that, essentially what was happening is they took people and they put them into these different groups. People who were firm on that man-made client climate change um, was real or was, was not real. And when people were presented with information, be it made up, that affirmed what they already had identified with, they suddenly, yes, that is totally right. Yes, I have been, and, they, and their opinion, of uh, maybe they believed it a little bit, their belief shifted even further. However, if they were given evidence that disagreed with their position, then they would ignore it. Oh, no, that's, they would dismiss it. I don't care about that new evidence. Social media has done a really good job of giving us opportunities to reaffirm our beliefs. And we feel oftentimes that we're too smart to get caught up in that. We feel sometimes that we're too intelligent. Like, no, I, 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 can, I can take both sides of an argument and I can... This, it shows that we struggle with that. And we wonder why our country is being pulled apart because we are constantly told that those people over there are not in our tribe. They're different than us. They're trying to attack our way of life because 
here is my tribe and it's important to me and those people are bad. What's really interesting is that when you take groups of people from different tribes, different sides of the political spectrum of religious, different ideologies, what we often find is that when we ask them questions that are not politically charged or not charged in these different areas, we find out what is actually, we, we, we actually have more in common than we think we do. We are all the children of Christ. We are all God's children. And we have so much more in common than we have that divides us. But not through an intentional thing, but just the way that social media works and the way that the media works, it is constantly working to separate us, to divide us. So what do we do? Let's read John 8, 6 through 11. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him, be, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bit down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. Jesus was presented with a no-win situation. They had trapped him. Find a different way. We do not have to react in a way that doesn't reflect Jesus. When we are presented with something that makes us angry and we think, how dare that person? They, how dare they, how could they even believe that way? We don't have to give a mini TED talk and argue about all the ways that they're wrong. Give them all the facts and figures about why they're wrong. There is an alternative to that no-win situation. Jesus gives us that example is that we can change the rules of engagement. We can learn more about people and look to find common ground rather than try and continue in our tribalism. It tearing people apart. Families, friends, people don't speak to each other. Sometimes for things as silly as Ford versus Toyota versus Chevy versus GMC or Dodge or whatever it is. Ah, those things are funny. But there are issues that are much more serious that we can't seem to find a way beyond. That person is just too far gone. No, they're not. Jesus died for every single one of us. And it is our responsibility to reflect Jesus in those seemingly no-win situations. Jesus changed the rules of engagement. He didn't play by their rules because their rules were not based in love. How do we change the rules of engagement? What are we to do when we are presented with a no-win situation? Acts 1 verse 8. At the ascension of Jesus. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We can't rely on our own past experiences to always help us win those no situations. Just like on the Oregon Trail, I thought I was clever. Yep, I know what's going to happen. You got to be careful. To relying on yourself. We can't always depend. I'm more intelligent. I can figure it out. 
Maybe. Don't depend on your own past experiences or your own abilities. And that's great. We don't have to. When Jesus ascended into the clouds, the Holy Spirit was left here to take his place. We are asked to be his hands and his feet. We are asked to reflect Jesus because he is not here. He has gone up to heaven. But he left the Holy Spirit for us to reflect him and reflect his love. My encouragement to you, if you've taken nothing else out from this choose your own adventure sermon, is to reflect Jesus in all of your interactions. There's nothing, nothing more important. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for the promise of coming again. Thank you so much that we have your example. Thank you for the Bible that gives us these stories, these examples of how you lived your life and how we can reflect you to everyone we come in contact with every day. Thank you for this time that we have had together. Thank you for this beautiful day. Please be with those who are not with us today. Please, please bring them back safely here with us next Sabbath. Thank you for all that you do for us. We are so grateful. In your name we pray. Amen.